Namaskaram. As we know that Swadhyay has started, and now we move to the next phase of Swadhyay 1.1, where Dr. Somna Dev will share the next part of the video, which the participants will see, and then they will discuss among themselves along with the exercises which will be provided. So, let us move to the next video. Great. Um. I welcome everyone to the session two of this uh, Swadhyay. Um, so, in my last lecture, we have discussed a proof of the fundamental theorem of uh, finite abelian groups, um, and then only one part was uh, missing, namely lemma two. Okay, so today we will be discussing the proof of lemma two. If you have not gone through the last lecture, I would recommend that you go through that before uh, going through this video. All right. Let's begin. So, what is the statement of lemma two? Let G be an abelian group. of order p to the n for some prime p let a be an element of g of uh, having the maximum possible order in the group. So, let A belongs to G be an element having maximum possible order in G, okay, among all elements. All right. Now, what we do is we consider <coughs> the cyclic subgroup generated by this element A. Let's call it capital A. Okay. And the statement or the, the, the lemma 2 states that uh, your group G is the internal direct product of this A and some subgroup Q or some subgroup Q. Okay, so A is some cyclic subgroup and Q is another subgroup and you have this internal direct product. Okay, that's the statement. Now, how do you go about proving this statement? Okay, let us begin. So, we prove by induction on the integer n. Okay, so you, you have this order as p to the n. We will induct on this n. All right, so the proof. is by induction on n. So, for n equal to 1, what happens? You have p to the 1, which is p. So, if you have a group of order some prime p, you know that it is a cyclic group, right? So, if g is cyclic, there is nothing to prove, right? Your uh, you take any element from your group which is not identity that generates your whole group right so your small a in that case would be any non identity element in the group and uh, so capital a would be equal to capital g 
and q will be uh, a trivial subgroup okay so for n equal to 1 the statement holds okay now suppose that this statement is true for all natural numbers up to n minus 1 okay so suppose the statement is true for all m less than n okay up to n minus 1 this is true and we want to prove it for n okay now let us make two cases here okay so case 1 what is this case suppose there is some element b in the group g okay such that this b is not in a capital a okay which is basically the subgroup generated by cyclic subgroup generated by small a all right it is not there and b to the p is identity okay suppose you have some element outside a such that the pth power of that element is identity what will happen in this case okay now suppose you you consider the cyclic subgroup generated by this small b let us call that capital b okay note that the intersection of capital a and capital b has just the identity so they intersect trivially why why do you say so okay suppose not suppose uh, there are some more elements so so suppose not so this will imply there exists some b to the k small b to the k in a intersection b okay for some one less than k less than p okay all right now you see that since b to the p is identity and b is not identity right uh, this b to the k where one less than k less than p this also generates capital b right okay but since b to the k generates capital B, which is equal to the cyclic subgroup generated by B, you can write this B as some power of B to the K. Okay. So what you can say is B is B to the K to the L. Right. Right. Or right. This, what is the meaning of this? B belongs to the um, cyclic subgroup generated by B to the K and then you have uh, what we can say from here, what we can say from here. 
Mm. Right. So since b to the k is there in a intersection b, right? So the cyclic subgroup generated by b to the k is a subset of a. Right? So this is actually a subset of a. Since b to the b to the k is is an element of a intersection b and hence it's an element of a any power of uh, b to the k is also in a so the cyclic subgroup generated by b to the k should be a subset of a and then this will imply that b is in a which is a contradiction right we have assumed our small b is not in a okay? so this is a contradiction so this proves that the intersection of A and B has just the identity, no other element. All right, we'll use this fact. Okay. Now let us consider um, you have this G, right? Let us consider G mod B. Uh, you can see that this is actually, uh, so, so B is normal. So you can talk about G mod B and let us, let us call this, um, as G bar. Okay. Let me see. Um, Yeah, B is anyway, uh, so everything is abelian, right? So, so B is normal, so nothing to worry. So G mod B is a group. You, we're, we're calling this G mod B as G bar, all right? Uh, now, since B is not trivial group, right? At least one non-entity element is there, namely small b. Okay. When you quotient by b, okay, you can say that the order of g bar is strictly less than order of g. Right. Now, our claim is if you consider the element a bar, okay, what is small a bar? So a bar, I'll come to that. So I want to say this, okay. So what is a bar? You have this quotient map, right? Uh, let's call that pi g to g mod b. This is my g bar, right? This is a quotient homomorphism, right? So under that, this A bar is nothing but pi of A. Okay. So I'll, I'll denote for every X in G, X bar means the image of X under this map pi. Okay. So what I want to claim here is the order of A bar, sorry, is equal to order of a. Okay, how do you how do you say that? Let us see how. Okay. First of all, note that since it's a it's a homomorphism, this pi. When you have some element, okay, you take any element in this case a, the order of the image always divides the order of the element. So what I want to say is order of pi a, which is a bar, okay, this divides order of a. So order of pi a is nothing but order of a bar. This is always true for any uh, homomorphism. This is always true. The other way we have to see why. 
Okay. If you are seeing this for the first time, please check why it is true. Okay. This, this is always true for any homomorphism. Let us see the other way. Why order of A divides order of A bar? Note that if you consider A bar and you take the power as order of that, okay, it's obviously it's E bar. So E bar is the identity in G bar, right? All right, this is definitely true, right? Now, this will imply that if you take the the image of this element under pi, so namely pi of a to the order of a bar, okay, this element, the image of this element, which is nothing but pi of a to the order of a bar, right, since pi is a homomorphism, right, which is equal to a bar to the order of a bar, right, pi a is equal to a bar and this is identity. Or identity bar. Okay. So, what I'm saying here is you have this element. Okay. When you apply pi on it, it it goes to identity. Okay. What can you say from here? You can say that this element a to the uh, order of a bar, this is in the kernel, right? What is the kernel of this? It's capital B, right? Okay. Now, this element is there in B, but this element is definitely there in A because it's a power of A, small a, right? So, but a to the order of a bar is there in a. But we have proved above that the intersection of a and b is the trivial subgroup, right? So what we can say from here, we can say that this element a to the order of a bar is the identity because it's there in a as well as b, right? So what is the meaning now? What, what can you say from here? You have this a, when you raise it to the power order of a bar, okay, it's identity. This means the order of A divides order of A bar, right? So this implies order of A divides order of A bar, right? This is what we wanted. We already proved or it's, it's trivially true that the this side, namely order of A bar divides order of A, that's anyway true. And now we are saying order of A divides order of A bar. From these two, we can say order of A bar is equal to order of A. That's, that's the claim, right? We have proved that. Okay. I think it's clear from up to now. Let us move on. Now, since A has the maximum possible order in G and you are saying the order of A bar is equal to order of A, okay, what can you say about A bar in G bar, right? So when you take any element under any homomorphism, when you, you start with an element in the domain, okay, 
when you go via this homomorphism what you get okay the order of the image always decreases in some sense right it cannot go higher so so here a bar is the image of a and i'm saying that a is the a has the maximum possible order in in the group g okay so what we can say is the a bar in g bar also has the maximum possible order in g bar okay so try to understand this since a has maximum possible order in g we can conclude that a bar has the maximum possible order in g bar among all its elements right this you can do right now so we have this g bar right it's it's abelian group and we have seen that mod of g bar is strictly less than g right so you can apply the induction hypothesis on this g bar so g bar has order less than mod of g which is p to the n right so anything less than that if you take any group of that order we know that the theorem holds the statement holds there and in g bar you have already found one element which is a bar which has the maximum possible order there so you can apply the theorem the statement on g bar right so what you can say by induction hypothesis what you can say you can say that g bar is equal to the cyclic subgroup generated by a bar cross some t right because a bar has the maximum possible order in g bar right for some some subgroup t in g bar we can do that now look at this t okay this t is a subgroup of g bar but what is g bar g bar is nothing but g mod b okay now there is a theorem called correspondence theorem okay which says that if you take something like g mod b okay and any subgroup of g mod b will be of the form some q mod b where q is a subgroup of g okay okay so you can you can apply that here what it will you will get is this t will be of the form q mod b for some q subgroup of g okay <clears throat> all right this you can say uh what is q by the way q is basically so you have t which is a so let us consider again the map right so you have pi from g to g mod b and you have some some subgroup t here right so t is a subgroup here so what you do is you basically 
consider the pre-image of capital T, right? So pi inverse of capital T, that is basically my Q. Q is a subgroup of G, okay? and this Q maps to T under this under this map. Okay, so so from here you can say that this T is nothing but Q mod V. So image of Q is Q mod V, right? So from there you can say T is Q mod V. Okay, right now, so so it's, it's it should be clear to you. Now, <clears throat> what can you say from here? Okay. So the claim from here is you have this capital A and you have this Q, which is a subgroup of G, the claim is G is equal to the in internal direct product of A and Q. Okay. Now, to prove that G is A cross Q, what we need to prove is, we have to prove that G is equal to A times Q, right? So, Okay, uh, and the other thing is the intersection, A intersection Q is identity. Okay, these two things we have to prove. The first part is you can take as an exercise. So G is equal to A Q. You can check why it is true. All right. Let us see why this intersection is identity, okay? So suppose it's not, suppose, some, some power of A, say A to the I, belongs to the intersection, okay? So any such element will be, because it's in A, it will be A to the I, from here, what you can say is a bar to the i, which is pi of a to the i, is in q mod b, is basically t, okay? But since we have this, right, what we have? We have already applied the induction hypothesis in this line. Okay. Okay. From this line, you can see that the cyclic subgroup of A bar and the capital T, they don't have anything in intersection, any anything non-trivial. Right. So from this, we can say since this a to the i, a bar to the i is there in t, as well as it's a power of a bar, so it's in the intersection of the, the cyclic subgroup generated by a bar and t, right? What we can say? We know this is trivial, and hence we can say a bar to the i is q mod p. This is this is this belongs to q mod p. Okay. Ah, sorry, 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 sorry. I did something wrong. What we can say here from here. Uh, a bar to the i is identity, the e bar, okay? But now, what can we say from here? 
See, the order of A bar and order of A are equal. We have proved. And I'm saying here that A bar to the I is identity. Okay. What we can conclude from here is A to the I should also be identity. Okay. Please check Y. Right. So order of A bar is equal to order of A. From this line, we have proved this. We can say that since A bar to the I is identity, A to the I must be identity. Okay. But then what does this say? We have taken some element from the intersection A and Q and we are saying that that element is identity, must be identity. So A intersection Q has to be the identity circle. Okay. So we have, we have proved this. Okay. So this proves, this is completes the proof in case one. Okay. So for case one, okay, if you assume, let us go back. Yeah. So this was the case one. Suppose there is some B in G such that B is not in capital A and B to the P is identity. We have shown that our group capital G has the desired form. Right? Right? We have proved this. Now let us consider case two. Okay. Case two is easier. So what is case two? Suppose there is no such element. Okay. So suppose there does not exist any B in G such that B is not in capital A. Okay. Which is basically the, the cyclic sub generated by small a. And B to the P is identity. There is no such element. Okay. And in this case, what we want to conclude is G is equal to capital A. Okay. So the claim is G must be equal to capital A. Okay. So there is no element other than A, capital A, if this holds. So again, so we prove by contradiction, suppose not, suppose not, this means what? There is at least one element in capital G, which is not in capital A. So there exists some x um, in G, x not, not belonging to A, okay, and, and with the property that this x has now the smallest possible order. So what I want, okay, suppose G is not equal to A, I'm assuming there are elements in capital G which are not in capital A. Now you can, you can collect all those elements with this property, which have the smallest possible order. Right? See, anyway, identity is there in capital A. So identity is gone. <clears throat> So in the remaining whatever is left, you can of course talk about the smallest possible order, right? Okay. So it will be some, some natural number, of course not, uh, identity. so it's not identity. Um, so what I want is there exists some X, X is not in A with X having 
the smallest possible order. Okay. Now you note that when you take the element x to the power p and you take the order of that, okay, this is definitely less than order of x. Right? So if you if you are raising x to the power p and you are talking about the order of x to the power p, this will be definitely less than order of x. Okay. Remember you are you are in a group whose order is p to the n. So what we can say is uh, So x to the power p, its order is less than order of x and x has the smallest possible order in outside A, right? So what we can say is this element or uh, the x to the power p, that should be in capital A. By the, because, it, the, the, because the order of x is the smallest possible with the, with the property that it's, it's not in A. So x to the power p should be in capital A. Okay. All right. So what we can say from here. Now any element of capital A is of the form A to the i. Right. So you can say that x to the power p is some power of A, A to the i for some i. Okay, we claim that P divides this I. Okay, let us see why. Let order of A is equal to P to the sum S. Okay. And note that the maximality of the order of A implies that, okay, so maximality of order of A implies that x to the p to the s is identity. Right? But when you take x to the p to the s, this is equal to x to the p whole to the power p to the s minus 1 which is equal to a to the power i because x to the power p is equal to a to the i. You can replace that to the power s minus 1. But then this is identity. Okay. Now, since you have order of A is equal to P to the S. What you can say? You can say that P divides I. Right? So, from here what we can say? We have so this implies that your x to the power p is equal to a to the i where p divides i, right? Now you consider this element. Let y be this element 
which is a to the power minus i by p times x. Okay. What is the speciality of this element? Note that when you take y to the p, you have a to the minus i, right, times x to the p. Now, a to the power i is x to the power p. So, a to the power minus i, uh, sorry. So, this is, you, you can just rep, uh, replace x to the power p as a to the i, right. So, this will be a to the minus i times a to the i, which is equal to identity. So, you have got some element y, right, whose, when you, when you raise to the power p is identity. And now, your x is not in A, right? So, this y is also not in A. So, what we note here is this y is not there in capital A. Okay? Since x is not in A. Okay? So what, what we have got? We have got the scenario where case 1 is true, right? We have this element y which is not in A and y to the power p is identity. But we have assumed in case 2 this is not true. We don't have uh, such element. Right? So, so this is a contradiction. In the sense that in case two we have not we have said that there is there is no such element. Okay. So so now you you think about this. What is what exactly we did? We we divided the the whole scenario in two cases. Okay. In case one we have proved our statement, and in case 2 we have claimed that my my group g is equal to a and hence with some counter uh, some some uh, way of proving okay you go through this again so you assume that g is not a and you land up to some some contradiction So, this completes the proof, okay. This completes the argument using uh, induction and this completes the proof of lemma 2. Okay, so I understand that this is a technical lemma, okay, so that's why the idea was to record the proof so that you can pause and go back and see and understand. Okay, so please go through the proof again if you if you have not understood some of some parts, discuss with your friends, and we will meet again to discuss your doubts. All right, so we stop here. Thank you.